From the heartland of America and the gateway to the West, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie. This is Coast to Coast AM. Later tonight, the spirit world. And welcome to the beginning of our Thanksgiving week. And don't forget, we are live Thanksgiving night for you, so join us. Here's what's happening. Peaches, plums, nectarines distributed by HMC Farms and sold nationwide as recently as last week are being recalled due to an outbreak of listeria that has resulted in 11 illnesses, including, get this, one death, 10 hospitalizations sold around the U.S. by retailers, including Walmart and Sam's Clubs. The recalled fruit may be contaminated with listeria, an organism that can cause serious and at times fatal infections. As of November 17th, the people sickened in the listeria outbreak reside in seven states, California, Colorado, Florida, Illinois, Kansas, Michigan, and Ohio. One person died in California. Another became sick while pregnant. Sad story there. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is investigating a series of recalls covering 6.4 million Hyundai and Kia vehicles related to brake fluid leaks that may lead to fires. The audit query will cover 16 individual recalls since 2016. My gosh. OpenAI, the company behind the AI chat GPT chat box, has been sending shockwaves through the AI industry after it suddenly fired its CEO again on Friday, triggering another high-level series of resignations there and has now named a new CEO who's actually their third in three days. Let's ask our expert, Lauren Weinstein, what's going on and what this means for the AI industry and for all of this. This is a strange story, Lauren. <laughs> it's, it's, it's insane, actually. I mean, do you remember the old Benny Hill show? Yes. Okay. Now, that show had a theme. The actual name of the theme tune was Yakety Sex, that they'd play whenever there were people running around fast doing crazy things and such. Well, that's the tune I want everyone to think of playing in the background as I explain about what's going on at at OpenAI. Now, I'm not going to try to do a real chronology, but basically, yeah, they've had three CEOs since last Friday. The board suddenly fired the existing original CEO, who was considered to be one of the very top names in AI. Then the president of OpenAI quit in protest, along with some top researchers. Then there was talk of the original CEO, who had been fired, coming back. But then he and the president who resigned apparently went to Microsoft. Now, Microsoft, of course, has invested billions in OpenAI and in OpenAI's ChatGPT, which they've now tied to their Bing search engine. And then hundreds of of OpenAI employees apparently said they'd resign if the entire board of OpenAI didn't resign. And now, late today, apparently the Microsoft CEO said that the fired original OpenAI CEO, who was reportedly going to Microsoft, might actually go back to OpenAI in some capacity. And yet all of this since Friday, and there's even more I won't even try to get into now. Now, apart from all the executive suite confusion, there are some really important issues involved in this for the entire AI industry, and so also for all of us. And it's crucial that we try to see the entire forest and not just the individual trees in this situation. And what's at stake here is nothing less than the controversies that you and I have discussed before about how rapidly AI, large language models, are being pushed out for public use, in many cases, obviously, before they're really ready. And this is happening because so many firms view AI as a kind of gold rush of potentially enormous profits, and they're terrified of being left behind, even if that means pushing out these systems, even knowing that they're often going to spout completely wrong answers, misinformation mixed in with accurate information, which is a particularly awful situation, and so on. So now we've seen this battle come spilling out of a major AI firm boardroom and splatter across the industry, Now, indeed, there are certainly controversies right now about what the board might really have felt versus how the firm had been operating up to now versus what they said when they fired the CEO. There's finger pointing in all directions, and what the ultimate impact of this particular situation will be isn't clear at all. But for sure, these are issues that aren't going to be going away, and I suspect that we can expect a wide variety of other battles in these realms, some even more intense and confusing than what we're seeing right now, 
long into the foreseeable future. Keep your eyes on this story for us, Lauren. Thank you. How strange. President Joe Biden turned 81 today, a milestone likely to draw attention to his status as the oldest person to ever occupy the White House, with opinion polls showing Americans worried that he is too old for the post that he's seeking re-election to. Mr. Biden addressed those who worry that he's too old for the vigors of the White House with humor and attempted to convince voters that his age and experience of over half a century in public life is an asset. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter, a longtime advocate for mental health and human rights, has died surrounded by her family two days after she entered hospice care following a dementia diagnosis in May. She was 96. She was married for 77 years to former President the 39th president of the United States, Jimmy Carter, who is in hospice himself, and he's 99 years old. Amazing. Stephen Cates, Dr. Sky with us with his weekly report. Rosalind was quite a first lady, though, Stephen, wasn't she? Absolutely, George. And I know their son, I think Chip, was also one of the first to actually have people celebrate amateur astronomy on the White House grounds. But uh, what a dynamic family for sure. But, George, we begin in space over the weekend. Maybe people missed it because it wasn't in the primary portion of the news. The second launch of Saturday of that massive Starship rocket was described by SpaceX as an overall success, even if you blow up rockets. But here's what they call success. As the launch achieved stage separation, George, this is something, a technique known as hot staging. What is this? It's the firing of the second stage motors before the first stage engines quit. Why would they do this? It would give some extra 10% power to future payloads to space, and Starship will be carrying lots of heavy payloads. But the booster rocket, as we now know, was destroyed, and also the Starship's second stage met the same fate, too. But why they also consider it a success, no damage, George, to the launch pad like last time, as their new water ablation system lessened the heat and force which destroyed the launch pad in the first April launch attempt. Launch attained a height above the Earth of some 93 miles. And we find out all this with Starship's incredible, get a little bit, 17 million pounds of thrust, making it simply the world's most powerful rocket. Moving now out into deep space, here's a question. It's a very interesting answer. What is the most common color of objects in the universe? Astronomers have searched the universe as they search for the most likely color. With so many stars, galaxies, and clusters to look at, the answer to this back in 2003 was the predominant color of the heavens is not the obvious black, because black is not really a color but a shade. But actually, George, it's greenish white. Now, that's a strange answer. Mm. But a new and revised survey tells us the new color is a beigeish white color called by a new name, kind of uh, comical, called cosmic latte. Maybe this will give the folks at Starbucks a new option for a coffee option. That sounds interesting. But here's another conundrum. Jupiter's red spot is shrinking. Jupiter, as we know, is the king of the planets and easily seen on any clear night in the east at sunset, 88,000 miles in diameter. The planet itself rotates once, an amazing speed of nine hours and 55 minutes on average. But the most recognized feature in Jupiter, George, is simply the great red spot. It is what? A massive storm high in Jupiter's clouds, which is an anticyclonic storm, meaning it rotates counterclockwise every six days as the sun's ultraviolet light attacks the ammonia in these upper clouds in the storm. But the great red spot may not be so great after all. It's been shrinking over the years. Now it's only the, about the diameter of the Earth, which seems massive by space standards, but a far cry from the possible largest size when it was 25,000 miles in diameter back in the year 1881. Simply, no one knows the the answer that is the why the spot is shrinking. Wrapping it up in the live sky, the moon now passed first quarter, the next full moon, pay attention to that, folks, November the 27th, 4.17 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with the full beaver moon. Constellations, the winter constellation of Orion, now rising in the east around 10 p.m., But the brightest of all stars other than the sun, Sirius, following that by about an hour later in the southeast. More at theskylive.com. Emails, we love them. DrSkyShow at gmail.com. What do we say, George? Always remember to keep your eyes to the skies. Simply, I'm your navigator on the highway to the heavens. And my sincere wish to you, the staff, and all the listeners 
a most joyous and happy Thanksgiving. Likewise, Dr. Sky, and we'll talk to you next week. In a moment, L.A. Marzulli back with us, his latest video, Out of Place Artifacts. My, oh, my, where did they come from? He's next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Nori with you. L.A. Marzulli back with us, author, lecturer, filmmaker. He has penned many books, including the Nephilim Trilogy, and received an honorary doctorate for the series from the Pacific International University. L.A. has lectured on the subjects of UFOs, the Nephilim, ancient prophetic texts, presenting his exhaustive research at conferences, churches, as well as appearances and interviews on media outlets worldwide. He's a regular contributor here at Coast to Coast. His latest film is called Out of Place Artifacts. L.A., welcome back, and uh, you ready for Thanksgiving? Happy Thanksgiving to you, George. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You too, my friend. How have you been? Doing real good in yourself. All good, all good. I'm in St. Louis with the family, heading back to L.A. after that, after Christmas, and starting. I can't believe we're going into 24 pretty soon. It's rolling by really quick, isn't it? It's unbelievable. (laughs) It it truly is. It truly is. Okay, you have pumped out another one on the Trail of the Nephilim series. This one is called Out of Place Artifacts. What's going on here? Well, you know, it's amazing because I've, I've traveled not all over the world, but I've traveled to a lot of places. And every now and then you see something, I see something, and I kind of go, you know, this just, this is out of place. This doesn't belong here. From Peru to the Vatican to uh, over in Israel to Spain uh, to Portugal. I mean, it's, we, we didn't do everything, but we, we, got, we got enough of them to create, I think, which is a great film. It's over an hour. I want to thank Josh Peck because Josh did the final edit on it and uh, brought it over, over the line. That film has been kind of sitting um, on my desk for a little over two years because my focus has been, as you know, on the whole UFO phenomenon. And we have se- uh, six films out on that. Seven, eight, and nine are all in post-production. So we're, we're really cranking out the work. But I really wanted to get this film out because it was just, it was like half done. And I, I thought, I think, I still do. I think it's, it's, it's an important film because it shows that something else is going on here. Uh, something which it's not jiving with the official record, as it were. Lex has some images that you sent to him posted at coast to dot com LA. Mm-hmm. How many different artifacts are we talking about? Well, I mean, you've got everything from the Vatican obelisk. And I'll never forget when I we were over in, in Italy and we were touring there. Um, we were actually filming um, at different megalithic sites all over the country. Some of it we've used. A lot of it we've never used. It's just sitting in the archives because uh, it's you know it takes a long time to actually get a film out. So I'm I'm in Vatican Square. I'll never forget it. And I'm, I'm walking around this obelisk thing, and I'm kind of going to myself, "What's wrong with this picture? I mean, what am I looking at here?" And so I I got back to our room, and um, I I Googled it, and sure enough, this thing comes from Heliopolis, in Egypt. And uh, mm. actually, Caesar Augustus brought it over in 35 B.C. But this thing, this obelisk, it's made out of red granite, and it was probably at least another 1,500 years before that where this thing was constructed. There's no hieroglyphics on it. No one knows where it actually, who created it. It just winds up in Heliopolis. A special barge is created to move this thing back uh, into Rome, and then Caesar Augustus uh, erects this thing later on Caligula uses it. I mean, but I'm looking at this thing thinking to myself, oh my gosh, it's it's like, I think 300 tons. It's 84 feet high. And, and here's the kicker. And we demonstrate this in the film. This is, this is red granite. This is really hard stuff. We actually interviewed Jim Vieira, who I know has been on, on coast before too. Yeah, yeah. And Jim Jim weighs in on this thing, and, and he's looking at the obelisk like I am. And he's going, wait a minute, where does this thing come from? Who created this obelisk? Because you go back, let's say, let, let's, just, let's just go 2,000 years. Now you're in the Iron Age, and okay, iron's a different deal. But you go back into the Bronze Age, or even before that, where this thing was allegedly made, and it begs the question, how the heck can they do it? George, for every centimeter or inch or sixteenth of an inch that this thing rises, it's the the diameter, circumference of this thing is changing. It's changing all the time. So people will say, well, you can take a chalk line and 
and go to the quarry and snap it and, you know, tink, 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 tink. Yeah, but this is granite. And we demonstrate in the film, and it's just one of my favorite parts of the film, that you, you can't really uh, dent granite with a copper chisel. We have a brand new copper chisel, and we've got a small block of granite. And we show it in the film, and we're going bam, bam, bam with, and we, and the the guy is hitting the copper chisel, and after like seven or eight hits, he shows the the which, which it went before we started hitting the chisel on the granite block, a nice sharp edge, completely blunted. Jeez. So it's very enigmatic. Where it's kind of like the Great Pyramid. It's the same type of thing. But where does all this come from? And if you go, if you go into YouTube and you, they've got people with with copper saws and sand and mortar. And I get that. And, I, and I'll grant that you can, you can cut blocks of granite with a copper saw and mortar and sand. Cause the sand is harder than the granite and the copper. And, and so you get two men on either side and you can cut a block. I understand that, but show me, just show me how you cut the obelisk and the sides are polished. And then how do you move it? When it was moved, I think it was 1586, uh, one pope decided to move it. The guy's name was Sixtus, Pope Sixtus V. So he decides to move this obelisk. And they've got etchings of it, which are just mind-boggling when you look at what it took to move this thing just a few hundred yards. I mean, that's all they did. It's like 900 men and 300 horses. And when I say that, they were all positioned around the obelisk with ropes and pulleys and levers and blocks of wood. I mean, the production is unbelievable to move this thing. I was going to say, yeah. how did they even loosen it, L.A., to get it to move? Well, exactly. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And so there's a few of these things around on the planet. I look at that, and in the film I say, in my opinion, this is Nephilim architecture, fallen angel technology is what we're looking at because the technology that created that in my opinion is no longer on the planet archaeologists will look at my statement and scoff and laugh but then you go to another place and we sat down with a uh, an archaeologist there um, and i'm talking about of course saxe waman in peru i've been there several times like two or three different times and i've actually led a tour there with tim alberino which was incredible. And when, when I lead a tour down there and we're at Sacsayhuaman, and these, these megalithic stones are polygonal in shape. They're 60, 100 tons, 40 tons, 70 tons, all over the map, polygonal shape. And, you know, I'm not, obviously, other people have looked at this, Eric Van Daniken. I remember reading his book as a kid, you know, as a teenager and going, my gosh, I've got to go there. And then winding up there at some point much later in life. But, you know, people like Brian Forrester has put that on the map. Um, a lot of us have looked at it, talked about it. I know Ancient Aliens did a, did a whole thing at Sacsayhuaman. Well, but the bottom line is this. If you cannot cut andesite stone with a copper chisel, then you can't do it. We demonstrate this, of course, in the film. And, and moreover, how do you move 60 tons of stone? So it's, it's nothing new, but is it an out-of-place artifact? You bet your boots it is. And there's, of course, others in the film. We left, we left some of them out because it's probably later on down the road we'll do it part That's two or something Part two, like that. sure. Explain to us, kind of paint us a picture in a couple minutes we have before the break of the obelisk itself in terms of what it looks like. 84 feet tall, um, 300 tons. Red, it, it's pink granite. It's highly polished. Uh, Pope Sixtus V, why did he do this? After they moved it, he performed a rite of exorcism on it. And that begs the question, what did he know that we're not being told? Why would, why would the Pope perform a rite of exorcism on the obelisk? Why would he do such a thing? I mean, granted, Caesar Augustus brings it over, Caligula um, erects it, and what was the Circus Circus? Um, but when Pope, by the time, this is 1586, and it's still, it's 900 men, and 300 horses, depending on who, who, what, what account you, you actually read. It's either three months or six months or nine months to move the obelisk. It's just a few hundred yards, if that, from one area to the other. And, of course, it's an unbelievable undertaking, as, as we talked about. But Pope, the, the Pope performs this rite of exorcism, and that is now uh, carved into the base of the obelisk. And what's amazing, 
you know, a lot of plays artifacts hidden in plain sight. Millions of people go buy this thing every single year. I mean, millions of people see it, go buy it. And how many people are are just inquisitive enough to go in and start, well, where did this thing really come? Like I was, because I looked at it and said, Something's wrong with this picture. Hold on for a second, L.A. We're at the break. The obelisk is just one of the many artifacts we're talking about tonight. We're going to Peru next with L.A. Marzulli. And welcome back. George Norrie back with L.A. Marzulli, his latest video film, Out of Place Artifacts. L.A., where do people get a chance to watch this? Uh, it's up on our streaming site. That's streaming at L.A. Marzulli.net, streaming.L.A. Marzulli.net, or if you want to get the DVD, it's just lamarzuli.net. But the streaming way is a great way to go because it's instant gratification. Uh, and you can check that out, streaming.lamarzuli.net. Great. You went back to Peru. What did you find there? Well, there's a lot of different sites in Peru. And it's just it absolutely, if you've never been there, if you've never looked at, down at Saksuaman from the little plateau, uh, and you look across the plaza, and there's Saksuaman, or you go to Oyotintambo and you look at the stones, um, the megalithic stones and the way they're constructed. Modern-day archaeologists insist that the Inca built these. But those of us with eyes to see look at this and go, you know, you're, you're, you're smoking something and you're dishing out a lot of hooey. Because the Inca, you can see the difference between the Inca slop, which is really a nice wall, but in comparison to what is actually there, the ancient megalithic structures are done in such a pristine, um, workmanlike way that to do it today on any of these sites, could you do it? Possibly. But you're looking at st some of these stones, like I talked about before the break, 60, 80, 100 tons. How do you move them? And, you know, you go back a couple of thousand years before the horse was there. You've got llamas. I'm not buying that for a second. And the quarry is, according to Brian Forrester, about 40, 40 miles uh, away and at a lower elevation. And apparently, I've never been to the quarry, but Brian has. And he said a lot of these stones were quarried high up on the cliff. So how was that done? Uh, moreover, when you go to places like Oyotintambo, some of the stones which are, have been thrown down by some sort of a cataclysmic event, have they're odd-shaped. They're just not... Stones like like a pillar or uh, just a, a square or a rectangle, they have extremely weird shapes in them. There's something is cut into them. They're they're they've been shaped very deliberately to do something. Those of us who've looked at it basically posit that what we may be looking at is some sort of ancient machine that was destroyed thousands and thousands of years ago. So I sat there with an archaeologist. He's actually an archaeoastronomer. And, and, and this gentleman, Andre uh, Agassi, believes, as I do, that we're looking at technology, which is no longer on the planet. It's not here. I mean, you can't duplicate this today. And so we're sitting in front of this, this area, which has been cut out. And it looks like some machine was thrust into the rock. It's all polished. The corners are pristine. There are no chisel marks or grinding marks, anything like that. It's completely void of anything. And so you start putting these things together. And, and, I, and I've been on some of these sites like, like Machu Picchu, and the, 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 the docents will sit there and tell us that the Inca were master stone builders. And you just want to scream because you guys, are, you guys are just parroting what you were told to say. Obviously, there are two different builders here. The Inca came in and repurposed the stone, just like we see in Egypt, where the later Egyptians come in and repurpose these very, very ancient megalithic sites. But we see this all, all around the globe. Other people come in and they repurpose the site. We see it here in the Americas, in places like uh, the Octagon Mountain, the Circle Mountain. We film extensively there, uh, and that'll be... That'll probably be released early next year, that film. And what we discovered, I'm kind of hopping around here, but <clears throat> what we discovered, you want to talk about out-of-place artifacts, is just mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling. And, and we'll talk about that at a later date. But certainly Peru is, is high on the list of, of out-of-place artifacts where you actually come into a site like Machu Picchu and you look at it 
and you kind of go, oh, my gosh, where did, where, why? And, and who did this? And why was it abandoned? George, there's something I've been drilling into on, on all my travels all over. All these sites have something in common in that they are abandoned and abandoned very abruptly. And I'm not going to tell you what my hypothesis is. That's in a later film and something I'm still working on, still researching, talking to archaeologists, anthropologists, different disciplines to try to just try to get my, my hand on the pulse here of what we might be looking at. But it's, it's high strangeness to, to, to the coin a term from the late Dr. Gallen Heineck. I mean, it is high strangeness all day long. We're looking at something that's like, you know, wow, seriously? But we'll see because wherever I go, and I just I mentioned, you know, Machu Picchu, and when you when you arrived there, that site was lost. No, no one knew it was there. I mean, the natives around the area knew it was there, but even today, just to get to the top of it, it's actually extremely harrowing. You think they put like a ski lift in or something, but you get on the bus and you, it's very circuitous, and you do all these switchbacks and you wind your way up the mountain, and finally, there you are, and I'll never forget just coming into the gateway, and there's there's this ancient, ancient megalithic site, and the stones are huge, absolutely huge. And, of course, that begs the question, how were they moved? How were they cut? Moreover, who did it? Out-of-place artifacts? Absolutely, all day long. L.A., you talk a lot about the fallen angel technology. Is that the same as E.T. technology? I would say no. Um, we have to define our terms. You know, E.T. is extraterrestrial. So by definition, anything that doesn't originate or, or is born or comes from planet Earth is an extraterrestrial. I prefer interdimensional entity, um, and I believe that these – uh, entities came here, set up shop. They did it over and over and over again. Uh, they were destroyed in, in the Great Flood. And every every culture on the planet has a flood story mm -hmm. of some sort. So we know that it happened. I mean, I'm not making this up. It's a question of, you know, why were these sites abandoned? Circling back to what I was just saying. Why are these sites abandoned? Why are they there in the first place? And, and how was it that that we would have trouble duplicating some of the, certainly Saxe Roman is, is a perfect example of that. We would have trouble duplicating that today. But you, you go to some of these other places. Um, we were set to actually go to Israel, George, right before the war. We, we were, Peggy oh, and I geez. were at the Prophecy Watchers Conference, and we were headed to Atlanta that day, Saturday. We were headed to Atlanta, and from there, on Sunday, we would have been in Israel when war broke out. So our tour, which we call the Nephilim, uh, tour is would have taken us into northern Israel, where a lot of these sites are. Um, one of the sites that we love to take people to, of course, is Gilgal Raphaim, and that's called the Wheel of the Giants, the Circle of the Giants. It's 42,000 tons of basalt rock in five concentric rings with a tomb, which I've crawled into, by the way, in, in the center um, of, of the site. It, and all these artifacts, L.A., are huge, all of them. Many of them are, but then you get other artifacts like the Nef we call it the Nephilim lens, and that um, I, boy, I'd, I'd love to talk about that if you want to go there. But the Nephilim lens is just, and you want to talk conspiracy stuff. We got into some really weird stuff when we were testing that uh, that lens. That was found by a Michigan hiker, wasn't it? Yeah, he's out. Um, Bob Shelley is hiking around, and he comes into this abandoned campsite, and the lens is there. And it weighs 28 pounds. And he's thinking to himself, do I really want to hike out with this thing? 28 pounds, it's not some light little object. And he's already got a full pack and he's out there camping. But he takes the thing. He brings it to us. We're there. Chief Joseph Riverwind takes one look at it and goes, it's not a sword. It's a lance. And then Chief Joseph tells us, this is mind-boggling, what's, what's in the Native American oral tradition, that the red-haired six-fingered giants, the Nephilim giants, would raid and come into a village of Native American First Nation people and with these lances, which are about three feet long, and they would they would run through three braves. Oh, they, as they're at, at, at one time. Lift, at one time. And they lift them over their head, screaming and yelling, popping their heads off, drinking the blood like, like a Coke can. 
I mean, they were unbelievable. And this all from Chief Joseph. I'm not, I'm not elaborating in any way. He comes on the record and talks about this. So Bob Shelley allows us to test the metal, and we take a very small sample. We bring it to a, a, a highly renowned metal testing lab in an unknown, unknown uh, location. I'm not going to give away the, or embarrass the lab. And we're met with a technician who assures us that the lab will be able to ascertain roughly when the thing was made, what the composition is, all the particulars that we're looking for. Well, six weeks go by. We were supposed to have the answers in two weeks. And I'm calling. It's like, you know, where where's the results? We So I fly back into this place. It's uh, it, near Detroit. I fly back in and I meet Bob Shelley there and, and we're, we're there now. But all of a sudden, the technician has a PR person next to her. She won't talk to us directly. Everything mm. has to be censored with the PR person. And she is absolutely um, just I mean, this is the managed agenda, and, and, and she's got she, and she's got the whole lance. She's got the she's got the whole thing. She, no, she no, she's just got a very small piece of it. Okay, there's we are one of the things I refused to do and told Bob Shelley this. We're, we're just going to take a piece of a lance. No way, we're going to let this thing out of our sight. No way. What piece did you take? The handle, the the we, tip, or what? We just took from from the, the hasp from the where the where it would actually tie into the into a shaft of wood. The thing weighs 28 pounds. I mean, it's really heavy. Yeah. So um, this guy, Christian Winder, who comes in uh, on the film, um, and and he had a, had a lab, and he heard my lamentation regarding the fact that we weren't really getting the, a straight shot with the testing. So he, he tested this thing, and they found isotopic ratios, which point back to a Middle Eastern connection, specifically Saudi Arabia, which, of course, that whole area, we call it Nephilim Central. That's where they roam. So it, it's not conclusive. It, it could have come from Michigan, but also it could have been um, because it's a bronze artifact. The tin definitely comes from Great Britain, no doubt about that. But it looks like it was originated in Saudi Arabia. So the question is, what the heck is that doing in Michigan? And the problem is here, with a lot of these artifacts, there's no provenance to them. In other words, I can't take you to the place where Bob Shelley found it, because someone else found, or it, maybe it washed up, maybe someone was digging. We don't know the provenance. We only know that Shelley found it at an abandoned campsite. So somebody was digging around in Michigan, and it's really interesting, of course, because Michigan is where those huge copper mines were, and a lot of copper, tons and tons of copper, has gone missing from those mines. Those those mines were 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 working and opened thousands of years ago, and that created the Bronze Age that we see in Europe. Native Americans worked a little bit in copper, but they didn't make bronze. They didn't do that. They they weren't smelting it down and creating bronze artifacts. So this is absolutely an out of place artifact, which is very enigmatic. And that's what the whole film is. That shows us that there is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world. And that's why we're creating these films. How do you find these places? <laughs> that's, that's a really good question. You know, I, I get emails from people all the time. Um, and, and we go down some, some wild goose chases. Absolutely. But then we go into places and all of a sudden... Uh, we're sitting there with our jaws on the ground going, you've got to be kidding. Uh, one such place was Zambujero in Portugal, which really isn't in the film, although I do allude to it and show some pictures of it uh, in the film. But Zambujero is or, or was this, it was a tell. It was completely covered with dirt. And that begs the question, why was this done? Just like Obekli Tepe, why, why did they bury it? Why, why is the site closed down? And then buried. Why is Zambujero thousands of miles away in Portugal? And who buries it? Well, that's that's my point. That's what I'm working on, and I, I just I can't really go there. But that's that's what I'm working on because something is going on here, and it it's and it's global, George. It's not just in one area; it's global, and it, and it happens at different time periods. When you look at Gilga Rafaim, the same thing. When you look at at Gobekli Tepe. The site's covered. When you go to Zambujaro in Portugal, huge megalithic stones. They're, they're over 20 feet tall. 
there's a tumulus there. And the whole thing was covered up with dirt. When you go to America Stonehenge, the site is closed down. The site was closed down originally. What we know now is the sacrificial table. They didn't even know what it was. They just thought it was bedrock. There were vines growing on it. They didn't know what it was. And so the archaeologists went in, and they started uncovering this thing, and then they realized, oh, my gosh, what's this? And, and But we hear about this over and over and over again, and it's, it's global. So something, something is going on which we're not privy to, which we don't understand yet, and that's why I really can't, you know, can't spill the beans because I'm not sure what I'm looking at either. Are these artifacts, L.A., all created about the same time period? No, they're, they're all different time periods. All different. For instance, the Nephilim Lance is, is much closer to our timeline than what we see down in Peru. There's this very enigmatic bus which was found uh, in an abandoned, well, in a, in a mine shaft. Um, and when we, when we filmed it, something happened, George, which was absolutely, we show it in the film, which was incredible because as I'm filming this thing, we're in a museum and I've got lights on it. And the camera is set up, and we're seeing detail in this bus, which we've never seen before. Uh, um, uh, the, the owner of the, of the bus had never seen it before either. He was blown away. We were blown away. So I, I went with this a couple of weeks ago, and someone said, L.A., are you aware that, look, that this bus, which shouldn't be there in the Americas, but it's there. It's definitely a Caucasian man. And it actually looks, and, and now that it's been pointed out to me, it's very reminiscent of the face on the Shroud of Turin. Which, really? I'm like actually, Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually uh, going down that rabbit hole and sending pictures of the bus to um, some sinologists and trying to get their their take on it. What are we looking at here? This thing was found... Um, tens of feet below the surface of the earth. I mean, it was just hidden away in some underground chamber someplace. And until we really photographed it and, and had it, something happened with, with the, the mirrorless camera. It brought out definition that you don't see with the naked eye. L.A., we're going to take a break and come back and talk more and take phone calls with you next. <laughs> 